Welcome to Christ the Center, Doctrine for Life, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey, and this is episode number 169. And we've got a great one lined up for you today. We're going to be speaking about a book, a wonderful little book, These Last Days, A Christian View of History. And we have the editors with us today. But let me introduce to you our regular. We have Jim Cassidy, who is uh, the pastor at Calvary Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Ringo's, New Jersey. Welcome back, Jim. It's great to have you. It's good to be here, Camden. Thanks. You sound a nice crystal clear today. I take it you're not in the Princeton parking lot? Uh, no, otherwise it would be <laughs> choppy. Like the, it's, it's, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You'd sound like a robot. But uh, we've got you uh, coming in nicely all the way from Ringo's, New Jersey, so we're pleased to have you, and we are very excited to have our wonderful guests. Uh, let me introduce to you first uh, Rick Phillips, who is the senior pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina, as well as the chairman of the Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology, which we will speak about. Thanks so much for joining us, Rick. It's great to have you back. Hey, Cam, it's great to be with you. Uh, a Wolverine, if I've ever known one. So we're, <laughs> we were speaking before the show about the Michigan Wolverines and our the great white hope of Brady Hoke. So hopefully this <laughs> uh, this year will be a good one for the Wolverines, the maize and blue. Uh, but certainly not as good as it's going to be for the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. And that's in part because of the great work from our other guest here, Gabe Fleur, who is the coordinator of public relations and publishing at the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. He is also a Ph.D. student here at Westminster Theological Seminary. Welcome back to the program, Gabe. It's great to have you. Thanks, Kendon. Always great to be here, brother. Yeah, we, we always love having you come over, and we're, we're going to be in for a fun one today, I'm sure, because you also were associate pastor, if I'm correct. At assistant. Assistant pastor mm-hmm. at Second Pres in Greenville, South Carolina. So you've got a good rapport with Rick, and uh, we're <laughs> going to have a good talkative day, I'm sure. That's right, absolutely. Well, um, we have this wonderful book uh, that we're going to be speaking about these last days, A Christian View of History. But before we get to that, I do want to mention that we are broadcasting live at reformedforum.tv in audio and video. And if you'd like to uh, participate and follow along in these discussions in the future, please visit us online at reformedforum.tv slash calendar, and you'll have an up-to-the-minute uh, uh, schedule of events where you can tune in and uh, keep track of us. You can also follow us on Twitter or Facebook. And uh, you can find us uh, through our website at those places where we post news and updates constantly about what we're going to be doing. So uh, stay tuned there. And, of course, we are listener-supported. And if you are able and willing, please visit us online at reformedforum.org slash donate and help us to continue to produce and distribute all of these programs free of charge. We love doing it, but we need your support to be able to continue doing it. So please visit us online and help us out today. Thank you so much for your support of everything we're doing at Reformed Forum, and especially this show, Christ the Center. Well, now I've got all that taken care of, gentlemen. Uh, We can get right down to business. We have an excellent book, which has been the product of the Philadelphia Conference of Reformed Theology. It's titled These Last Days, A Christian View of History. It has several excellent contributors and is published uh, with an imprint to the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, but is published by Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing. So check this book out. But before we get into the details of this book, I want to allow you, uh, Pastor Phillips, to speak a little bit about the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and clue some people in who may not be very familiar with your ministry and also let people know about the Philadelphia Conference of Reformed Theology, not only because this book is related to that, but also because you have some things coming up here in the near future. Yeah, we sure do. Like we're right in the midst of it right now. Well, the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals was founded in 1994 by James Montgomery Boyce, who was the first president, and it was a uh, endeavor to bring together leaders in the Reformed world uh, to uh, work, labor together for the cause of Reformation in our churches. David Wells had just published his seminal study, No Place for Truth, that really showed how theologically uh, uh, empty evangelicalism was and how we had just abandoned the great heritage of biblical and doctrinal truth. And so since then, we've been laboring together. We are, we are, the Alliance is really two things. One, it's a, it's a ministry with radio programs, and we publish books like this one. We run our conference, the BCRT. Mm-hmm. And it's also a, a, uh, a gathering of Reformed leaders, the Alliance Council, who coordinate their activities and work together. So it's both of those at the same time. Now, the, the Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology was founded in 1974 yeah. by James Boyce. This is our 38th year, actually. 
to again to elevate the great doctrines of the Word of God and to uh, as Boyce argued when he was asked at the time, why would you do a Reformed Theology Conference? This is back when there weren't any. This was really the first one. <laughs> um, and he said, look, every time God has worked with power, it's been through these doctrines. Yes. And so let's promote the doctrines of grace, and uh, we've been traveling around the country since then. I've been involved since the uh, mid-'90s in the PCRT, and when Dr. Boyce died in 2000, he asked me to carry it on. So I've been chairman now. I think this is my 11th or 12th conference, oh, wow. kind of scary. <laughs> so, you know, year to year we go from different cities around the country, and we, uh, last year it was a Christian view of history, these last days, which produced this book. This year we've done two of the conferences out of four. Our theme is adoption. It's children of God adopted into the Father's love. It's been a great conference. We were in Portland and uh, really enjoyed it there. We're just in Grand Rapids, had a huge turnout and just had a great conference there. We do Greenville. I think the Greenville conference will probably take place before you air this segment. Mm. It's April 1st to 3rd. Yeah. But the Philadelphia one is at the end of the month, uh, the, the last weekend in April, uh, over to May. I think it's April 30th to May 2nd. Um, Friday to Sunday morning. Mm. Uh, that's a 10th <laughs> present Philadelphia. So if you're not signed up, it really is a, what a great doctrinal theme for us to do, the doctrine of adoption. Absolutely. And... Uh, it's just really been a great conference. Uh, so we have, uh, I think in Philadelphia, it will be David Wells, it will be uh, Joel Beakey, it will be Steve Lawson and me. Uh, here in Greenville, it will be uh, David Wells, Derek Thomas, Joel Beakey, and me. Mm. Uh, at the same time, we're doing, we always do kind of a practical uh, pastoral pre-conference and seminars, and we're also looking at gender and family issues. So since the doctrinal themes on the family of God, Interesting. we're uh, we're looking at the pre-conference of Joel Beakey and me on the uh, on the Christian family, and then uh, we have seminars. I do a seminar on on the issue of gender in the church and those sorts of things. Joel Beakey does a great seminar on children ministry in the church. So it really has been a great conference. So if you're not signed up and you're hearing this. Uh, please consider uh, attending, I guess, in Philadelphia would be the one available, but that's the big one, Yeah, at 10th Press at the end of the month. Or if you're in Greenville and happen to be listening live, uh, or if you have friends that might want to go and you are listening live, please let them know. We'll try to get the word out as, as best we can in our different channels, but certainly... Yeah, it's going to be uh, a great weekend yeah. here in beautiful downtown Greenville, right in the middle of the spring. Um, it's, it's a wonderful time in the church. Yeah. You can't say too much about that, brother. You're making me homesick. <laughs> no. I'm looking out my window on the Main Street game. It is beautiful. Oh, I know that. I know where, exactly what you're looking out upon, too. <laughs> the, the shoeless Joe Jackson statue is right there. Oh. So. <laughs> it was uh, 22 degrees when I got out of the bed this morning. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's not as pleasant here Not today. as pleasant. No, no, definitely not. All right, brother. Well, um... The, you know we're very excited about that, and uh, that's very germane to what we're talking about today. Not only because the alliance is is working on both of of these things, but also because this book, which is our subject of discussion, is is very much the product of last year's conference. And I attended the conference, and I was I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was excellent, and I would encourage everybody who's anywhere close to one of these conferences to go. It's going to be a great time of fellowship and learning. Um, well, and- Joel Beakey told me that in his view, he gets around, he says, Rick, this is the second greatest conference in the world today. Mm. I said, well, that's nice. What's the first one? He said, well, it's it's uh, the Aberystwyth Conference in Wales. He says, that is actually <laughs> better than PCRT. But he said, after the Aberystwyth Conference, PCRT is the greatest spiritual gathering he's ever been at. Oh. And they are very really spiritually uplifting and intense. Yeah. You know, we uh, different, different conferences have kind of their different deal. Our deal is theology in the context of doxology. Mm-hmm. These are worship gatherings that are treated as such. They're in churches. We are not renting halls. Nothing wrong with doing that. We're not going to churches that we're just using. We are partnering with local churches. In the context of the church, we are doing theology amidst doxology, which is the most potent way that it is to be done. And it's just great. Every year it just blows us away. It's very palpable. I you know, I attended the conference at 10th last year, and just the singing and worshiping together was with God's people. It was, I was singing at the top of my lungs, and I was I couldn't hear myself. <laughs> That's right. I, I mean, it, it was just en- enormously, it was, it was incredible. And it is very different. It was... 
a worship experience, not simply just a uh, a lecture. It it it, I, it was very a tangible difference in my mind. Oh, yeah, Camden, if, if 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 I could give a plug for the conference as Please. well, when I first uh, became a believer, and, and um, <clears throat> a couple of years afterwards, I came to New Jersey to come back home. Uh, I was thinking about going to Westminster, and uh, I was encouraged by somebody, I don't even remember who, to go to the conference in Philadelphia, and, and I went. And um, it, it, was, it was absolutely instrumental in terms of the Lord's using God's people to build me up and to um, put into my mind and heart the doctrines of grace um, in, in a way that just um, did set my heart aflame for the glory of God Absolutely. and a desire to preach His Word. So, I, I mean, it, it, it really is that good. And mm-hmm. uh, I could, How many years uh, ago was that, Jim? Oh, that's got to go back uh, at least 12 years, probably 1997 or 1998, Oh, uh, those are great. It was probably the Amazing Grace Conference with Eric Alexander. It was a great one. Yeah. The uh, uh, yeah. Well, one day we kind of, it happens. A week, we it's kind of the immersion experience. Um, you we we do a doctrinal focus, and and our goal, my goal is that we will make a life enduring difference in your life mm-hmm. because you would really grasp that. Our goal is this year that you will never forget what it means to be a child of God because you're at this conference. And we look at it from, we we bring in the best figures we can, and we look at that diamond from several facets, and when you leave there, uh, the Holy Spirit often enables you to really get it in a way that you will never lose. And that's the benefit of that kind of intense immersion experience that we do at the conference. Hey, you know, Rick, that year, uh, I believe it was Don Kistler who was uh, yeah. preaching on abounding grace. And yeah, I still remember that address. Oh, I, I still remember that sermon, and I could still see him up there at the pulpit uh, talk, saying to, to me and to us all that where your sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And I just walked out of that, like, uh, you know, the, the, the testimony of Luther as, uh, as he was reading <laughs> yeah. Romans, you know, as if walking <laughs> into heaven itself, and, and it really is um, uh, that great of a conference, yeah. I think that may have been the greatest sermon our friend Don Kiffer ever preached. It was devastating. We had this, in the Chicago version that night. We would meet with every year. There's a guy from Detroit who would bus, he would rent a bus, and he would bring a busload of youth and college students from his church to the conference. And on Friday night after the event, he would buy pizzas, and I would do a Q&A. And I will never forget doing a Q&A in Chicago uh, with these college age and youth guys the night after John Kessler preached that sermon, and just watching how blown away they were. Yeah, and it was just one of the most beautiful times I've ever had in ministry. Was just seeing how blown away they were with the truth of sovereign grace. Amen. That's right. Absolutely. Well, um, speaking of the, uh, just this amazing conference, um, maybe Gabe, uh, you can. You both have edited this book and done a wonderful job, but maybe you can uh, just let us know a little bit of the process of how the, how this came about, how you compiled, you know, where did this material come sure. from, how you brought it together, and what the purpose was in in uh, bringing this book or turning a conference into a book. That's a great question. Um, you know, P and R Publishers have uh, publishing has been so great to us. They uh, last year I edited a book that you guys graciously interviewed me on on atonement, and this is ba- basically following the same uh, uh, the same pattern, and that is. We uh, choose several addresses. In this case, uh, for these last days, Rick selected those, and uh, we basically get the transcripts from uh, the the conference, and then we um, edit them and make them uh, a little bit easier to read, maybe. And uh, uh, you know, there's just such a difference, I think, between a conference, a spoken uh, word, and exactly written word. Yeah. right. So uh, we put those together, and what we're looking for again is to get people to under uh, to give them a flavor of what it was like, what we were covering, and why we were doing that. Mm. So I think uh, these last days, then, the book format there, you've got really the best of what went on last year. And, I mean, I think everything that went there, all the speakers did just great job on every location. Uh, and we just pull those together and uh, and put them in the book format so mm. folks can get a taste of what, what's going on at these conferences. Mm. Yeah, if you look at the first six chapters, they are the plenary addresses. And yeah. What we usually do is the opening address on Friday night is a – overview that really enters you in, and last year it was Sinclair Ferguson, oh. the Christ of history. Exactly. It was amazing. That's going to be really good. And then chapter two, the first session, 
on Saturday morning, we kind of sequentially worked through the topic. And so we looked at the present age, both in terms of it being, as Paul said, the present evil age. Uh, Don Carson gives an exposition. When I heard Don Carson's exposition of Revelation 12, I said, well, this has to be a book. <laughs> yeah, I don't, We don't do a book every year just because of fatigue and time and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I think this year's conference may also be a book. But when I heard Carson do, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody handle the book of Revelation with just such a natural felicity, a facility. And it was just, it, it was just remarkable. That's something, that, that is a devastating chapter. And then we did the positive side of the present. Uh, we did the present evil age, and then we did the age of the spirit, our current epoch as Voss would teach us. By the way, this is all of your heart as Voss. Um, <laughs> we know and that. Then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, we were, we were moving forward, and we did the resurrection hope, Michael Horton on the future resurrection. And then, actually, Phil Riken did the eternal glory, and it was such a good address. Uh, the, it was, actually, it was a very pointed address, because Phil was leaving tent at the time, and mm-hmm. he's talking about what we'll share together in the future. But actually, then when I heard Ligon Duncan, I actually went the Ligon version over Phil's when they were both extraordinarily good. And then Carson <laughs> did, so, so we kind of worked through redemptive history, starting with where we are now, and then we wrapped up at the end, chapter 6, what's the present implication of that? And Carson did the partakers of the age to come. Mm-hmm. So if you read this book, you're going to be given an overview of the Christ of history, you're going to be biblically explained the current age in which we're living. You're going to be shown what is the resurrection hope. And then what we very seldom talk about, but our forefathers used to talk about all the time, what is the eternal glory that is the, the, the hope for which we're living? Well, then after that, you have the, the, the seminars. And also the seminars were so good that I thought we had to do a book. Uh, Cornell's Venema. I one of the millennial views. I did a seminar on life after death. Mm-hmm. Jeff Jew did one on American eschatology. Yeah. And then Paul Tripp did a very pastoral one on living in the light of eternity. So, I, you know, I think that um, there's not a lot of great books out on Reformed eschatology. And I think this is a really, it actually is a real contribution. And I think yeah. it'll really help people. It's very accessible. These were met, these were addresses preached in the church. You know, the follow-up with the Paul of eschatology, uh, your artist Voss's great book, right. it, it needs to be translated into yeah, English. You can't be handing that out <laughs> in the, to I mean, the people in the pews. I remember standing in the aisle of the Westminster Bookstore 20 years ago, preparing to buy the Pauline eschatology for my Acts and Paul class with Dr. Yeah. Kaplan. Yeah. And Mike Kelly says to me, you know, the Old Testament prophet, Mike Kelly, who was a TA then, says to me, oh, that book's going to change your life. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, right. No, no, that <laughs> book changed my life. But I had to read it three times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so uh, what well, the funny thing about the book was I was not trying to fill the conference with all, all millennial guys. I was going to ask you and about this. A, you made this comment in the preface. It's, this is an interesting note. Yeah, I, I made, actually, I made a point of not asking anybody yeah. what their view is. I have yeah. them like either Carson or Bay. You know, those guys are Baptists. One of them's going to be historic pre mill. <laughs> no, no, it, it shows you <laughs> the hegemony of and the dominance of Voss's insights mm. in the Reformed world that if you are of our generation today, Unless you were so misfortunate as to be post millennial, you are certain to be a millennial. I mean, really, pre millennialism is dead in our generation. Now, do you think, uh, I was going to ask you, what do you think of the, the reasons for this convergence upon a millennial thought? Do you think it's just the inevitable weight of, of Voss's contribution? It just took some time to catch up, or do you think there might be some yeah. other reasons for that? No, I think that's, well, I think the pre millennialism is mainly a creature of its time. Hmm. And then there's, there's some things going on in 19th, 20th century, I think, that make dispensationalism seem a little unusually plausible. Mm. Um, but I think so. I think that that's partly true. So pre- premillennialism uh, is, is frankly so unbiblical. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, but I, I do think it's just the weight of Voss's insights, and you get stuff like uh, what's the great book that Sam Waldron did, Gabe? Uh, End times made simple. End time. What a great book that is. Calvert yeah. Press publishes it. And, uh, yeah, I think that the, the, the sheer scriptural weight of Voss's work as it's finally gotten popularized is just conquering the field, except in the theonomically leaning, you know... The transformationalist type crowd. Yeah, uh, 
And uh, I think except for that, the kind of the reconstruction, post-millennial view, to which I confess to being extremely hostile. I'm actually <laughs> well, more hostile to post-millennialism than pre-millennialism, because pre-millennialism, I can't even say it, pre-millennialism I think is virtually dead. Well, I think it's interesting you noted there about the uh, the 20th and 19th century uh, developments there. Uh, Dr. Jew's chapter is really outstanding yeah, on that. He's done amazing work on this subject. Yeah, and he, mm-hmm. he again, it's just one of those things where you've got a top scholar like Dr. Jew who is, I'm not mis- mistaken, he wrote his dissertation on these mm-hmm. kind of topics. Mm-hmm. But he brings it down. Um, you know, Van Til used to talk about feeding the uh, bunnies and feeding the giraffes. <laughs> and if you only feed the giraffes, you haven't done your job to the church. And he can bring it down to a level where I think it's so accessible but so deep that you walk away, um, like for the rest, <clears throat> excuse me, the rest of the book, meditating on it and saying, yeah. "Wow, that's where that came from." Now, when we speak about but Gabe, uh, Gabe, you're just sucking up to your prof. You're <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have Doctor Jew. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great guy. I'm just teasing. <laughs> well, speak. Uh, since we're on the topic, I, I want to back this up just a, a little bit to kind of rope some people in that might not be following, but um, oftentimes you hear the word eschatology and we think of it as a very narrow, strict discipline that refers to the ordering of certain events that we find in the book of Revelation, maybe Daniel and First Thessalonians. But when we speak of it um, as, as, a, as, as Vossians or as uh, uh, Reformed people coming to it from this two-age eschatology, eschatology is a much bigger term that also encompasses pretty much all of redemptive history. If uh, yeah. if we know the end already, we know what Christ, Christ came and did his definitive work. He ushered in the age to come, although we still live in an overlap of ages. Rick, maybe could you explain a little bit about a two-age eschatology and ex- explain how we often use the word eschatology in a much broader sense than is typically it, it found? It makes me chuckle because I think it's an act from Paul at Westminster Seminary. When yeah. Jennifer was teaching, inevitably about the third class some student would raise his hand and go, excuse me, Dr. Gaffin, you keep using the word eschatology, and I think you're using it in a different way we're used to it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> model go. Exactly, because popularly eschatology means that series of events that will happen right before the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that is part of eschatology. But eschatology, eschatos means the end. But eschatology really means the redemptive historical structure of biblical truth. The Bible takes place within a history over which God is sovereignly bringing salvation to his people and displaying the perfections of his glories in, in redemption. And uh, every doctrine has an eschatological dimension to it. It is progressively unfolded in Scripture and, uh, and develops its full contours over history. In fact, all reality and truth is eschatological. It's all heading somewhere. So eschatology for us... Is a it's is is biblical history. Mm-hmm. That's what the subtitle of the book is: a Christian view of history. Exactly. That's what we mean by reformed eschatology. The the Bible's history, um, and, which of course is future from where we fit. It's so helpful to know where we are living. There are differences. We're not dispensationalists, but there are certain differences between our eschatological setting and and the structure of how redemption is lived out now than versus the Old Covenant. Mm-hmm. And there is a future that's going to be somewhat different from that. It's going to be wonderfully different when we're resurrected into glory and we are we, and we are uh, we are transformed into perfection and all that. And so we really need to live in the light of the future and understand how it relates to the present. Yeah. And that's what we mean by eschatology. Now that's extremely liberating. And by the way, that doesn't mean that we don't believe in the things the Bible says about what's going to happen before the return of Christ. There will be different views on it, but we're not negating that. But it's just this great expansion of the whole idea of God's great work in history. Yeah. Now, speaking of the the title, how does the, the title, These Last Days, relate to that very helpful uh, clarification you just made. When are these last days, and how are we to understand this within uh, a solidly two-age eschatology? Yeah, I have to admit the title does skew it in a somewhat amillennial direction. Although I'm quoting the Apostle Paul, who refers to the last days. <laughs> the last days are not, it's not the era, the compressed years before the return of Christ. It is the time between the times. 
It mm-hmm. is, yeah, and you talk about two edges eschatology. One mm-hmm. of the great contributions Voss made. In fact, I remember Jim Boyce used to always say, "If you think you have a new idea about theology, there's a 99 percent chance you're wrong." Yeah. <laughs> well, well Voss's two edge structure was the one percent. You know, if you said to me, "Can you think of a, you know, some progress in theology in the 20th century?" Yeah, it's Voss's two edge understanding of the parousia, of the coming of Christ. Yeah. Christ coming is as a two-stage event. And as Paul says, he came first to make a sacrifice for sin, and then secondly, he returns to bring salvation, to, to bring in the final conquest. And so the last days are the age of the Messiah. Israel, if you're in Israel, you're looking forward to the age to come. And how often did Jesus talk that way? Both now and in the age to come. Jesus is constantly talking that way. And the prophets are looking forward to the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is in general, and it's kind of used differently by different prophets, but in general, it's the day of the Messiah, when God's salvation shall come in the form of the Anointed One, who will bring to fulfillment the uh, anticipation and hope of his people. That is a two-stage event. And we are living in these last days, the days of the Messiah, which have been so far, it's been 2,000 years. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the first coming of Christ is to is to make atonement for sin and to accomplish righteousness for his people, which he will impute through faith alone, and then to take up his reign as the Messiah. And then there's this present history, these last days, when the gospel's going forth, and the harvest is coming in. At the end of that time, the Lord Jesus will return, and these last days, days will, will yield to the eternal age of glory. Yeah. It's so helpful. And Dr. Gaffin, you've mentioned his course, Acts and Paul, he speaks of it as having an elliptical character. And ellipse is this geometric shape that has two focal points. And and he uses that as kind of shorthand to describe everything you've just mentioned right there. And it's so helpful to understand things. What he means by the ellipsis, of course, is that our present experience is being pulled in both directions Mm -hmm. by the first and second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. We're being pulled by the cross and resurrection and the radical implications that's done for us. But we're also being pulled on the other side to that which is our hope and the glory that, you know, Paul says that we are, in. I think in Titus uh, 2, he talks about our, our, our great hope that we are looking, we're looking for, we live out of the resources of the past with a great anticipation that we're facing to the future. Mm-hmm. And that's why this ellipsis, we're being pulled both ways. Exactly, exactly. I, I have uh, a question. Steve, Steve, Todd Kelly was right. I don't think Kelly, but... Uh, uh, Camden? Uh, Kelly. Uh, <laughs> pardon me? Uh, excuse, who, who are we speaking of? <laughs> the, guy, the guy who told me in the bookstore... Uh, oh, yeah, Mike know, Kelly. Reading, Mike Kelly, when yeah. he said to me, this is going to change your life, he was right. Well, we just said in five minutes will change your life. Yeah, you absolutely. Absolutely. It really opens things up when we come to understand things through that grid. And then once you start to see it, you find it all over the pages of Scripture, especially, though, in Paul and John. It, it, no, is, it is all over. Especially in the synoptics, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Constantly saying, both now and in the age to come, mm-hmm. both in the present age and the age that is to come. Absolutely. Jim, you had hey, something. Yeah, yeah just, uh, Rick, a, a question— Maybe this is a question on behalf of some of uh, those who might not yet be on board of the amillennial position, but <clears throat> is this a defeatist or a uh, pessimistic view of uh, of the Christian life, especially vis-a-vis culture and, and society? Yeah, I'm going to describe myself as both a – it's popular to say I'm an optimistic amillennialist, partly because Gaffin says that and everything Gaffin does becomes popular for us. <laughs> I'm a pessimistic amillennialist. Um, I'm very pessimistic about the world, about this present evil age. I am. I do not believe we are redeeming culture. I am very negative about the effects of Christian culture uh, having a centrifugal influence in gathering people in. This age is damned. This world is consigned to the lake of fire. Can we please stop saying we're redeeming institutions? We are not. We are not redeeming the world. Let's be negative about the world the way the Bible is. However, I'm very positive and optimistic about the gospel and the church and the Christian hope. And and we need a return. And I think on millennialism, one of the reasons why I'm so fervent for it, 
is we need to understand rightly the biblical antithesis. Mm-hmm. And I got this in this book with two addresses, this present evil age, and let me tell you, Revelation 12 is a negative view of the reign of Satan in this evil age, followed by the second, the next address, a very positive age, the age of the Spirit, the power that is available to the Church and to the Gospel. And so um, I'm very negative about the world and very positive about the Gospel and the Church. Amen. Mm-hmm. Speaking of uh, <clears throat> the pastoral implications of some of these things, uh, oftentimes people get hung up on eschatology or uh, these biblical doctrines and thinking they're just uh, things that impact um well, they're, they're just objects of study. Uh, in your chapter, you speak about the pastoral implications of, uh, and, a, and a pastoral guide to life after death. How do these uh, very rich doctrines that we find in men like Gerhardus Voss come to bear? You've already alluded to this, but how do they come to bear on our life and faith uh, in this present evil age? It's kind of crazy because, interestingly, the audio that sold far and away the most and really sold much more than is normal for our audience, was my seminar on a pastoral guide to life after death. Mm. I would have thought it'd be Ferguson's, you know, big whatever historical sure. thing, or Carson. No, because people don't know what's going to happen after they die. Mm. And there's such a pastoral need, and even our pastors need need help knowing what do I say to the dying person. Hey, we need to know this stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it's just very interesting to me. Uh, that just a fairly straightforward, here's how, here's what the Bible says about death and dying and life after death, here's the sequence that happens. That those things have been flying off the shelf, not because of my greatness, but because the topic really hit yeah. the cord. It's very yeah. interesting. What's that, right, Gabe? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Having been there and heard that, I think the uh, when when Pastor Phillips first came to Second Pres, I'd been there about three years before he came, and he used to do this thing called uh, the the question box. It's a wonderful thing where he would on Sunday evenings, as part of the service, he would yeah. take and answer a question you know that people had, and Fun. I'll never forget the one that people asked about cremation. Oh yeah, and I was out. There was a lot of moms who would you know stand outside and, and nurse babies or take care of kids and take out. There was an influx. I was never forget. I was uh, coming back in from to the sanctuary at that point in the service, and there's just this crush to get in to hear this. Uh-huh. So there's a lot of folks who have these questions, and having been in pastoral ministry, uh, having been at the deathbed of dying saints, um, people are scared. People have questions about these things. And I, I think that that's one of my favorite chapters in the book for that reason. This is something that if you've got friends, um, I mean, who who if you're a Christian who doesn't have friends who are going to send you an email or give you a phone call and say, hey, somebody I know has just gotten cancer. Mm-hmm. Somebody I know has been in a car accident. Somebody I know X, Y, and Z. And, and y- you have to be able to respond, even as a Christian, let alone a pastor, to those concerns from a biblical standpoint that's carefully thought out. I think um, Pastor Phillips' chapter helps you uh, helps you do that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it's such a, a pressing issue and so important. And the, 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 the sales and all the things, yep. the interest and examples you've given just go to testify to that. So at his uh, chapter 8, if you're able to get your hands on this book— um, moving on to the next chapter, I mean, we can, maybe we can come back to uh, some of the earlier ones in a minute, but let's speak a little bit about evangelical eschatology American style. That's the <laughs> chapter by uh, Jeff Jew, who is a professor of history here at Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, Gabe, maybe you could just uh, let us know a little bit about uh, this chapter and describe some of the usefulness and the benefit to reading it. Well, one of the things that I think can become troublesome with folks doing church history is that it can become merely a study of history and not church history. Mm-hmm. Uh, the good thing about a chapter like Dr. Jews is, is that he, it's, um, it's not simply a sociological study of what was happening in the 19th and 20th century. It's set in the context of God's providence and his providential dealings mm-hmm. with the church at that time. And it gives a very good historical overview of what gave rise. And some of the, the forces, obviously it's a complex issue, but some of the forces that gave rise and some of the uh, currents that gave rise to the dominant eschatology and evangelical today, uh-huh. which is dispensational premillennialism. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Rick ministers down in Greenville. I spent most of my life there. It's heavily, heavily influenced by this. Yeah. And 
uh, folks have a lot of questions because the first question you'll get as a reformed person, if you're in an area like the South or, or even other areas of the country where this is the dominant evangelical uh, eschatology, is that you are going to spiritualize away the text. Exactly. You're called an, <laughs> you know, an allegorizer you're or something. You're going to allegorize the text. take Revelation 20 seriously, those sorts of things. You know. Yep, and it, you're going to land yourself mm-hmm. right back in the lap of the Dark Ages. You know? and, you know, I, I, did a, I did a commentary on Zechariah, which of course yeah. is from a biblical, that is an amillennial perspective. And boy, when you do a book like that, from an amillennial perspective, I mean, the dispensationalists just go nuts on you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially that text. Yeah. Well, and the thing that we that Dr. Jew helpfully points out is that there were a lot of cultural factors influencing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is not, oh, yeah. in fact, uh, the, the, the dominant eschatological note struck in the history of the Church. Uh, and we need to go back and reexamine the foundations. So I, I think he did it in a very pastoral and helpful way, and his exposition of Daniel um, in there is really just well done. I mean, to have a church history and do, historian do it that well is just really great. So Yeah, and it's a testimony to him, too, and, and uh, just the skill and abilities to be able to communicate at a more popular level yeah. when he's done the deepest possible work, uh, you know, in the in the classroom and in his study as yeah. well. So uh, Dr. Jew is a tremendous gift, especially in this chapter here. Yeah, and it's helpful, again, if you're in that context, and so many of us are, that we don't want this to come across as, uh, boy, you know, we really think uh, dispensational premillennialism is the cancer of the church. Um, it is it is harmful, we think. It is not the, the truth. Yeah. But one of the best ways to combat something like that is not only to, I mean, we're Vantillians. You don't just do defense. You positively set forth the truth as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great example of that in Dr. G's chapter. Mm. Yeah, I think that's... That this, let me say the same thing, too, because uh, while we are going to differ strongly, I think that the dispensational conviction that the Church and Israel are fundamentally and principally different is just biblically wrong and can be shown to be wrong and needs to be shown to be wrong. And yet, uh, God bless our dispensational friends. Uh, and I think it's, it speaks well. I think there's been a constructive dialogue. Guys like Dr. Poitras have been involved in this. Oh, yeah. Over the years. Uh, I think, you know, the dispensationalists help us from a hyper-covenantalism to which we can be prone. Mm-hmm. And I think if you look at the progressive dispensational movement coming out of Dallas, you know it looks an awful like like covenant theology. Why? Because they're good Bible folks. <laughs> and the best thing about dispensationalism has always been, these are good Bible folks. And we may differ with them, but you know, being good Bible folks takes you a long way. It does. Yeah, yep, that's yep. what we can hope for, having a, a high view of the text and taking it seriously, and that's to be commended in most all, or most, at least of the dispensationalists I've known personally. Uh, but we we would also hope and pray that you continue to read and understand some of the deep structures that you find in the text, and and, and I think that that is clearly a, a two age eschatology, something you find exposited and promoted uh, by Gerhardus Voss and many of his followers. Yeah. Jim, yeah, I, I was just <clears throat> going to say, um, going back, and then I'll go forward <laughs> like a good biblical theologian. There you but, go. <laughs> uh, um, just just going back to the pastoral aspects of preaching. If I could just. Um, uh, give another testimony as far as how important this book is and how important the conference was last year. Um, You know, we we get talking about eschatology, um, and maybe because it's a big word or whatever, but people tend to kind of roll their eyes and, you know, well, I'm just a a pan-millennialist, it all pan out of the idea, and and they blow (laughs) off the discussion as if it were just a divisive uh, uh, thing to to bring up. Um, But but the pastoral implications – Oh, I was bringing this up in our membership class at our church here as I was talking to the folks, and, and I said, you know, that it really does have serious implications for not only reading your Bible, um, but also how you live your life. Yeah. And I said, I said, you know, in, in many ways, every sermon that I preach is a non-millennial sermon. Um, now, obviously, I'm not, you know, articulating um, <clears throat> amillennialism using technical language or, or, or giving a, 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 a treatise on, um, on eschatology per se, but, but every single text that I read is, is read um, in the light of the once and for all finished work of Jesus Christ, um, and then his also coming again, as you've already articulated, yes. the, 
the two age structure as and we as the church as those who stand between the ages. I mean, you have to understand your your historical geography as a Christian um, in light of Christ's first and second coming uh, in, in order to properly understand the Bible and the Christian life. Mm-hmm. But um, and now here's where um, I, I want to go forward and, and ask another question. Uh, perhaps Rick or, or Gabe, whoever wants to tackle this. Um, one of the great insights as well that Voss has come up with, um, in, in addition to all those other ones we've discussed already, but is the idea that eschatology um, is already there before the fall. Um, you know, his expression that he, he's come up with um, in, in his excellent little piece, not a little piece, it's actually a substantial piece on the eschatology of the Psalter at the end of his Pauline yep. eschatology. Oh, yeah. yeah that eschatology fantastic. precedes soteriology. Um, would, would one of you be able to just kind of tackle that in a pastoral way, and, and, and how important is that, not only for hermeneutics, but for the Christian life to understand this notion of eschatology as, as being the very driving force of redemptive history and Bible interpretation, etc.? Well, like a good assistant minister, I punt to the senior. <laughs> well, I would say this, that, um, you know, the, one of the charges made against Calvinism and reform thinking, I, it's something I personally have not experienced a lot, so I don't quite get it, but I suppose there's truth to it, is that our decretal approach to theological categories can be abstract. Well, let's not do that. And one way in which uh, the whole idea of God's predestinating will and his his counsel and all that, is to see the eschatology of it, because eschatology brings us into the story. And that's a story that is the story, and we're in the story, and the eternal decree of God, God decreed the eschatology in which we are in. And so when we see there's an eschatology, there's a historical development, both in history and in the plan of God in his original decree, then we see that those doctrines are our story. You know, we always say, you know, history is his story, Jesus' story. And it's also our story in Christ. And I think it is a wonderful thing to thank you. I just pulled my copy of the Pauline Eschatology off my shelf because yeah. I'm preaching Psalms right now and I haven't looked, I need to read this chapter again. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there is the, 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 the eternal decree of God does not just spew out doctrines into the ether. It spews out a history which is designed to display before the cosmos the perfections of the glories of all the attributes of God. As Jonathan Edwards says, God glorifies his attributes by exercising them. He exercises those attributes in a history that is centered on the the reign of his Son as the Son of Man Messiah. It's just mind-blowing, even talking about it. If I'm telling you this, the thing that's not striking me is how dull and abstract this all is. Yeah, and I think, and I think it really rescues our doctrinal foci from uh, decretal abstraction. And I think, too, to, uh, to just uh, piggyback on that is, uh, you know, one of the things that was helpful for me in understanding the eschatology, say, of the garden is uh, Meredith Klein's Kingdom Prologue. And to see that even in view of Adam before the fall, there was a, an eschatology there that was set forth before our first uh, father. And when you understand the fall in those terms, and you see what our Lord Jesus Christ as the second and last Adam has brought us yeah. uh, in fulfilling uh, where our first father fell, again, there's no way you cannot but be just really blown away. As, uh, as Dr. Tipton put it once, he said, when you get all this together, I think he just, it's so simple but so wonderful how he put it. He said, really, it's just beautiful, Gabe. And that's one of the things that we should see is the beauty of God's plan and the splendor of his holiness and majesty as he exercises his attributes in history. But also that this, again, it's always in the text. You said it so well, Jim. When you're preaching, when you're teaching, when you're reading, there's an eschatology there, even before the garden. And the only reason I think that sounds foreign to our ears is because of our uh, tendency to think of it as something that is only at the end. And it really does require some reworking of categories. And again, and I think a, a, a really helpful way to do that is to read something like Klein mm. on yeah. that. And, well, and, yeah. Gabe and I, by the way, are, we're not full-blown Kleinians. 
but we are closet lovers of Kingdom <laughs> Prologue. Yes, we do. Rick actually was the one who uh, first introduced me to that book. But uh, one other thing I want to add to that is if you want a good overview of kind of how this works, I mean, Sinclair Ferguson's chapter, I got to tell you. Yeah, it is great. Yep. The first one. The first one. Mm-hmm. And I think he does such an amazing job. I remember um, editing that chapter and just uh, just stopping and worshiping. I'm not trying to be pedantic, brothers, but that's what that's happened. That was- don't go online and watch the video of that address, because you will see me, uh, it's one of the greatest moments of shame in my entire life, falling asleep on the tent platform. While, it's just an experience. It's, just a, it's, just, it's a, how old I am now and how fatigued I was. But I was horrified that I fell asleep during one of the great sermons I've ever been present for. Pitiful. Well, back when Gabe was on our staff, back when he used to be a minister, he, uh, we had a reading. He, he had this kind of a, re, he put together a reading thing, and, you know, we, we weren't reading. It. The book that we read as a pastoral staff was Greg Beale's The Temple and the Church. Of oh, the yeah. yeah. Uh, great book. What a great book. The eschatology of the garden and of the temple. One of the things I've been doing on the side the last couple of years, I've been writing Bible studies for the Rafiki Foundation to be used all across Africa in Christian schools. And I think there's like 8 million Africans reading these studies. Wow. And we had just read uh, the Beale's book on the temple when I was writing the first King Bible studies oh. for these millions. And I almost broke down in tears mm-hmm. as I had the privilege of writing for... Uh, you know, a variety of different kinds, children to adults for African readers, just presenting the building of the temple in terms of, frankly, the eschatology of it. And it, it was, it, I was overcome with emotion that I would have the privilege of just being the conveyor of this Vossian strand through Beale and his great book on the, if you haven't read the Temple and the Church's Mission, read it. It's a great book. Yeah. And here I am getting to present it. So these African readers will never have to slog through, you know, a moralistic view of the Temple, but they'll yeah. see it as a picture of the eternal glory and the cosmos garden, which is mind-blowing. Yeah, or as an end in itself, which we can often yeah. mistake, or many people do mistake the physical Temple for an end in itself. Um, which misses the entire point of it. Yeah, and I think, and I think it's the temple because it's the garden. Right. Yeah, he points out the link between the garden and the temple. And the eschatology is from the very beginning of redemptive history. The entire eschatology is present. And yeah. I, yeah, I think that's uh, one of the things that Dr. Horton does a good job with his chapter on the resurrection as well, mm-hmm. talking about, you know, what does it mean to... And, and this is, again, just another pastoral intersection here of the book. Um, when, when we think about resurrection, I think so many of us, it, what it gets treated like is a neat fact that God did that we've got to now defend with evidence and arguments. I remember watching a Christian apologist once bring calculus in to defend how the resurrection was possible. Wow. And this is right when I was reading Van Til, so I was pretty militant and just was going, what's the matter? You know, just need to deal with this the way, uh, you know, presuppositionally. What I think Van Til was doing, especially when it came to something like the resurrection, and Dr. Horton brings this out, is the fact that it wasn't just a neat trick God did. It is our inheritance. We are looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth. Death, while we are transitioned into glory with God, there are still the saints crying out, how long, O Lord? Mm-hmm. You know, and there yeah. is that end coming that we will be resurrected. We are not Greek dualists here. No. And yeah. that will have huge implications for how we minister to the um, young ladies in our congregation, how they view their bodies, how we view, how we minister to our young men and what they're doing with their bodies. This is the end of your body. It will be resurrected. You know, and that the is something... The eschatology of the resurrection is so intense. And and it's in this connection that, you know, we, we, we have to mention, I think, good old Dr. Gafford's resurrection and redemption um, mm. as, as an incredible resource for understanding how the resurrection stands at, at, at the climax of redemptive history and how it's the hinge upon which the ages turn and how all of the benefits of our redemption flow from the resurrection of Christ. I, I, it's just so absolutely essential, I think. And, and in connection with the um, idea of just going back to the eschatology in the garden, and then the benefits of Christ's redemption is the notion of, of justification and imputation. Yeah. Um, and I, I think to understand the covenant of works um, as having its end in an eschatological glory, 
um, is is absolutely crucial for understanding the 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 centrality, if I could use that word. Of, uh, of, of imputation of Christ's active and passive obedience to the life of the believer, without which there can be no entrance into eschatological glory. Um, and, it, it, I mean, this whole notion just, it, it just keeps on giving um, mm. in, in terms of pastoral and preaching ministry. Uh, it's incredible. Well, and I think, too, that that's so key, what you said, Jim, because um, one of the things that, that can happen, again, is that these can be detached from our lives. But when yeah. we start to see eschatology in its setting like this, it just opens up a storehouse of treasures. And also, one of the things here that I'm just loving is we're talking about the book here, These Last Days. People are, are just going off on, well, I've read this about it, and you got to read this book. And that's what we hope this volume will do, is to encourage people to become uh, you know, enamored, as it were, with how eschatology fits in to um, our, our views as Reformed Christians, but also how it enriches every category and the great, vast body of literature out there um, by our brothers in the faith who have written so well and helpfully on this. And I just love how seamlessly we've transitioned from doctrine to, quote-unquote, practice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting you talk about the, the, the importance of the role of the resurrection in our present life. One way I think it plays out is that most Christians do not think much of the present lordship of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I think most Christians, and partly the elliptical nature of the present age, I know that, but they think of Jesus primarily in the past. They're trusting what he did. Praise the Lord for that. And then they're looking forward to his, start, his, his return. But it's like he's on vacation now. <laughs> and rather than this idea that I am a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth, I once had a cult come along and try to recruit me, and, and, I, and I, they said, look, here's some, you need someone to disciple you. And I said, well, thank you for the offer, but I'm being discipled. They said, well, who are you being discipled by? And I said, the Lord Jesus of Nazareth. And they kind of looked at me and said, well, no, no, he's gone. I said, no, that's what you're wrong. That's why you're a heretic. That's, that's the, the great heresy of the cults, the denial of the present lordship of Christ through the Spirit. And what did Jesus say in the upper room discourse to the disciples? You're actually going to be in a more potent discipleship relationship after I ascend to glory. Because the Holy Spirit will come, the other helper. And I think it'll so enrich our lives if we understand the eschatology of the present. I am I'm in a personal relationship with God through Christ. No, no, that's right. I am a disciple of the risen and exalted and reigning Lord Jesus Christ as he leads me through his Holy Spirit by the ordinary means of grace. That's a pretty exciting life, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Suddenly, I don't have to have a lot of money to have significance. If I'm a girl, I don't have to sell my body to have significance. I am, you know, I am the doula. I am the doula of the risen Jesus in a present tense. Most Christians don't think that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Most real. Christians, I think, are are trying to help uh, the the golden age or the eschaton along uh, to try to <laughs> you know bring bring it about. Uh, you know, we need to really get Christ reigning here on Earth. Uh, you know, by transforming culture or whatever, um, and, and leaves out this notion that in fact Christ is King even now and even in the face and especially in the face of suffering, persecution, and 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 death and dying and all that. Uh, yeah. Jesus is not on vacation when a tsunami hits. <laughs> the the, the right. east coast of Japan. He is sovereignly in control and overseeing and ruling even in that situation. Hmm. Let, let me explain. Let me have the opportunity to explain my earlier comment about my my concerns about post millennialism. I have nothing against post millennialists per se. My concern is this, though. I think that the the way post millennialism is working today produces an emphasis on the power of Christian culture. Because we're through the Christ's achievements in and through us, through the Christian culture of the people of God and the Church, the Kingdom of God comes, and there's this optimism about the, the spread of Christian culture. And it's Christian culture this and Christian culture that. I have no confidence in Christian culture. I have confidence in Christ reigning through the Gospel. And I think there's a very subtle but significant difference between those who are relying completely on the work of the Gospel to regenerate lost sinners in a supernatural way, apart from which we have no hope, that would be my position. Versus those who really believe that by homeschooling our kids, I hope we homeschool my kids. 
and through our homeschooling or our Christian school network or through and through our our permeation of the superiority of Christian softball leagues and whatnot. And I don't mean to belittle it. Uh, my kids play in a Christian baseball league, I'm sorry to say, but they do greatly. Um, but we're going to put our effort into a Christian culture, and that Christian culture is going to bring in the kingdom. I do not believe that for a second. Yeah. Um, and I, that's what I mean. I'm pessimistic about this age. And while we're going to have a Christian culture, and people should come to our churches and realize they've left the seculum and they've come to the sacred and they've entered into a distinctive Christian culture, and yet it is always going to be the proclaimed gospel. Yeah, that's what changes lives. person and yeah. work. And see, that's, what I, that's my concern about postmodernism, frankly, and I, that may not be completely fair, but that is the nature of my concern. Homolonialism says that I'm very pessimistic about the world and its structures, and I'm relying completely on the gospel to save people out of that culture, to be sure, into the Christian culture. But it's not going to be the Christian culture that wins over my neighbor. Well, I think the thing, too, that's helpful to, to for this from the book standpoint is uh, um, Dr. Begg's chapter on the age of the Spirit. That's another thing that we have to look mm-hmm. at is that whole, uh, what we would say, you know, very technical language, the redemptive historical complex of events of the yeah. resurrection, ascension of Christ and his intercession for us now and the outpouring of the Spirit uh, on the whole church. Uh, gifting every Christian. There's no need for a second blessing. You are in Christ. Uh, he has poured out his spirit on the church. And we live with that tension now. We live between the epochs of two atoms. We live in this present evil age, under the reign, as it were, of sin and death mm-hmm. in Adam. But we've been redeemed from that in Christ. And so we have been raised from death to newness of life, to walk in that newness of life, as Paul says in Romans 6. And pouring out blessings on us is our Lord Jesus Christ yeah. through the you Spirit. Know, you know, that chapter by Alistair is very good. It's interesting because Alistair just personally comes from a different trajectory than us. He's a Willie Still guy. He was with Derek Prime in Scotland, and he's uh, just out of that, that wonderful directory. It's not exactly the direct bloodline of your heart as well. It's where we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, old West, Westminster being old Princeton. But I think it's your Cameron, your question earlier, is this Voss's ideas having so much power? I think it is. Yeah. Because you read Alistair Begg, a Baptist, uh, uh, Reformed Baptist out of Scotland. Uh, I mean, that's, that's your heart of Voss he's teaching. Mm. And I think he would say so. And I, I think it's just, it shows the, the power of these truths that have come from the Word for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. And um, again, this book is just a wonderful collection of so many great, uh, so many great uh, pieces that were delivered at the conference, and now have been turned and, and edited wonderfully into uh, the written word. And, and it's a very useful work to pick up. So get it. These last days: a Christian view of history. It's edited again by Richard D. Phillips and Gabriel N. E. Fleur. I like the double. The double initials are old, the British style. And it is uh, published uh, by PNR Publishing with an imprint to the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. So pick this up today. It is available now, and it is an excellent piece. And I think uh, we've done a sufficient job of stirring you up to wanting to read this book. Uh, I do need to mention a few things online. Uh, you can visit and see the ministry of uh Rick Phillips at secondpca.org. Also, Gabe used to be assistant pastor there. It's a wonderful website with a lot of resources, and there's a lot of things going on. If you're in the Greenville, South Carolina area, and and uh, you know, we would encourage you to visit that church if you haven't already. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, God's word is proclaimed faithfully there. And you can also visit the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals online at alliancenet.org. They also have all sorts of resources there, and and of course, many people will be familiar with reference. Information 21, which is their online magazine. But all of the things are linked to um, on the website. And of course, uh, for those listening live, the uh, Children of God Adopted into the Father's Love uh, co- PCRT conference is going to be uh, April 1st through 3rd in Greenville, South Carolina, and also April 29th through May 1st in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at uh, 10th Presbyterian Church, right? 
It's a tenth. Yes, it's yeah. a tenth. So uh, you know, register for that immediately if you are able to go. Uh, it, it, you won't be the same. Uh, it's going to be an excellent conference, uh, a very timely subject, and it's it's going to be an, an enduring collection of teaching for many years to come. And of course, you can visit uh, Jim online at calvary-amwell.org, and Reformed Forum is available at reformedforum.org. All of our links to all of our programs, all of our other websites and stuff are available on that website. And we do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.